Hey guys, um, in this video, I wanted to share a technique with you that I learned about recently. Um, I'm gonna call it uh, smart batching in this video. And I've been really excited to share it with you because uh, it, it's something that uh, speeds up BERT training times. And you know, it, it's a very intuitive trick. It, it makes a lot of sense. And you, you, when you see it, you're kind of like, oh yeah, why don't we do that all the time? <laughs> um, and yeah, so it speeds up, it speeds up training. This notebook, uh, we're gonna play with the IMDB movie review data set. I'm still collecting some benchmark numbers, but it looks like it's speeding up training from maybe like 30 minutes down to 20. So, you know, pretty substantial improvement. And um, it doesn't have any negative impact on the model's accuracy. It doesn't appear to. And I think when you see the implementation, you know, it makes sense. It's like, I, I don't really see why it would hurt the model in any way. Um, yeah, so maybe the, you know, the only caveat or negative point is just that the libraries don't already implement this feature. So in order to, to use it, you kind of have to work around the libraries a bit um, and implement a few things you know, with custom code. But I've done that here and I've shared the, the notebook. The link is down in the description so you can uh, check it out on your own. And yeah, let's go through it a bit. Um, so I need to highlight this, uh, I learned about this technique from uh, a blog post done by Mikhail Benesti. He's um, French, he works in the, the legal space, and he, he wrote a nice blog post kind of explaining this technique, and they did, uh, he and his team did some you know, detailed analysis of the uh, techniques. It's almost like a, like a research paper kind of with their analysis and explanations. Um, so pretty cool. And then he also shared the code for, uh, for doing this. Um, the bummer thing, let's see, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see some of it. Uh, yeah, the main, you know, a main piece is this smart collator class. Um, and it, uh, inherits from the data collator class from, uh, transformers. And unfortunately, um, I think the transformers library like broke compatibility with his code. So his code doesn't, uh, doesn't run successfully for me at this point. Um, and then it's also, you know, it's uncommented. Um, so of course I have to like take it and comment it to death. Uh, but yeah, the, so I took a couple key pieces of the implementation from his code. Um, one of the main ones is this, the build, build batches function. Yeah. So thank you, Mikhail, for sharing your research and your code. This is really cool stuff. So let's talk about, uh, how it's implemented. So. Smart batching is all about how we pad our input sequences to BERT and how we kind of choose our batches for training. So this uh, illustration is intended to, to show kind of like our, you know, what we might call the standard approach. Uh, it's the approach that I've used in all of my example codes so far. And uh, I've taken some example sentences from the French data set that Mikhail used in his code. So these are 12 sentences that have been tokenized. And for the sake of illustration, let's just assume that, you know, this is the full data set, just these, these 12 sentences. Now, when we train BERT, we could actually just feed in, we don't have to do any batching or padding. We could just feed in one sequence at a time and BERT is fine with that. Um, we don't do that though, because GPUs are much more efficient when we can give it multiple training samples to work on in parallel than if we just you know feed in one at a time. So we try to create batches uh, of training samples to, to feed through all at once. And then you know in order to create those batches, we want to put um, here I'm using a batch size of four. Uh, usually larger batches are more typical, but um, yeah, we can't like make a matrix out of these four samples that you know is very has a variable number of columns. A matrix needs to have a fixed number of rows, fixed number of columns. So what we do is we just pad out our sequences all to some single fixed length that uh, allows us to you know, turn, our, turn our batch into a rectangle. And you know, the max length we pick either by looking at the longest sequence in our data, like, like we did here. I've chosen a maximum length of 14, or you know, it might be like some um, more arbitrary number that we've picked that uh, you know, we'll truncate anything longer than 128 tokens, for example. But either way, we, we kind of pad all of the batches, all the sequences out to the same length. And then to make sure that BERT doesn't look at these pad tokens and try to interpret them, um, we create something called an attention mask. And the attention mask is really simple. It's just a list of ones and zeros. 
it's a one in every position where there's a real word, and then it's a zero wherever we have a pad token. I haven't looked at the implementation of the attention mask in detail, but I imagine it's something like, you know, maybe you multiply the mask by the attention score for this token. Um, so that would zero out the score, and then this token would have no influence on the embeddings for the other words. Um, so, you know, something like that. So that's great, it works. The, the problem here is that even though the attention mask is preventing these pad tokens from uh, having influence on BERT's interpretation of the text, uh, they're still part of the processing. So all of, these, all of these pad tokens, even though they don't you know, influence the result, they are still contributing to the compute, the total compute of uh, uh, running you know, through these, these sentences. So we've got a lot of these pad tokens that are kind of like, you know, no ops. They're not helping anything and they're extra compute. And when we have a, a fixed length, um, we've got 12 samples and they've all been padded out to 14. 12 times 14 is a total of 336 tokens in this data set. So the first uh, smart batching is really kind of a combination of, of two techniques. And the first technique, um, I guess, is called dynamic padding. And Mikhail says in his post that this is kind of something that's been around, so they're not the first to try this technique. Um, but it's simply the idea that instead of padding all the batches out to the same length, you look at the longest sequence in each batch and you only pad out to that length. So. These, these sentences, you know, have a maximum length of 13, so we've, we've only padded to 13. Same with this one. And this is maybe kind of a poor example for the benefit of, of dynamic padding because we've, we have these, uh, these long sequences that happen to be in batches one and two that are kind of like, you know, throwing things off. Um, so if these batches were a little more uniform, you know, we'd, we'd see a better benefit from this dynamic padding technique. All right, and then here's the, here's the second piece, which uh, Mikhail calls uh, uniform length batching. And the idea is simply that we're gonna, before we create our batches, we're gonna sort the entire data set by the sequence length so that when we pick our batches, they end up being more uniform in size. So with, the, with dynamic padding here, uh, we cut it down from 336 to 324 tokens. And then here we've cut it down uh, a lot more to 288. So I think this picture does give us some cause for concern. The conventional wisdom is that we want to we want to shuffle our training data. We want to kind of randomly select our samples to make sure that. Uh, we're not stuck in some bad ordering of the of the data, um, and yeah, ba based on what I've drawn here, it looks like it's always going to be the same order, right? If we sort them by length and then slice them up into batches, then it's going to have the same um, input sequence every time. Um, of course, you could you could shuffle it a bit and you could do them in a different order, right? You could you could take that batch first and then that one and and then that one. That would give you some randomness. Um, Mikhail's code takes it one step further to, to add some additional randomness to the batching. And what he does is, you know, instead of, instead of just like slicing them all up, um, as they are, he picks, he selects the starting point for the batches randomly. So for example, we could kind of like, we might start at sample one for our first batch and we'll take these four, uh, which requires us to go out to there. So that would be one batch. And then, you know, we pick another random point for the, the next batch. So let's say it ends up here. So we've got to take all that. Yeah. Um, and then the, the final batch would be the combination of, you know, whatever's left here. And we can see that it does kind of like fragment the data set a little bit. We've, we've uh, left, we've orphaned some sentences. Um, but I think that's a much smaller problem in a in a real data set. I think it you know it just looks bad because I only have like twelve samples here. Um, yeah, so the fragmentation doesn't seem to be too big of a deal 
in the uh, IMDb movie data set. And it seems like a good trade-off too to, to get a little more randomness in there. All right, sorry about the math errors in this uh, last segment there, guys. Uh, I guess I'm only human. <laughs> uh, but let me take you through some of the, the key parts of this notebook. Um, we're gonna use the IMDb movie re review data set, pretty popular one. Uh, basically, it consists of a bunch of movie reviews and they're labeled either zero or one, corresponding to whether they're a negative review or a positive review. There's a good kind of variation in the length of the reviews, so it's a good like candidate, I think, for, uh, for this smart ba batching technique. Um, consists of 25,000 training samples, 25,000 test samples. The classes are balanced in both. Um, yeah, so really the, the interesting part is this section four, the, the smart batching. And kind of a quick overview, we're gonna, we're gonna go through the data set, we're gonna tokenize all the samples, and we're not gonna do any padding um, because first we wanna sort them by length and then we'll pick our batches uh, starting at random points, um, like I showed in the, the last slide. And then once we have our batches selected, that's when we'll add our padding. Uh, and then we can uh, fine tune BERT and see how it does. So first of all, we have, we have to load our tokenizer, of course. And um, for the padding, we do still need to uh, truncate, unfortunately. So. Something I've been running into a lot recently with my uh, the examples that I've been working on is that if you try to train BERT uh, with a batch size of 16 and a sequence length of 512, um, and you're using a Tesla K80, which has 12 gigabytes of, uh, of RAM, the K80 is like one of the older GPUs, but you know still has a ton of memory. Um, batch size 16, sequence length 512, you're gonna run out of RAM. <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Apparently BERT is a huge memory hog in the GPU. Uh, and I was, you know, initially I was kind of excited. I was like, oh, maybe this, maybe this smart batching technique will sort of help address that, right? Because we can like uh, make some of the batches shorter so, you know, they don't use as much memory. But really what it comes down to is like, we're con the, the GPU memory problem is all about the peak GPU memory use. So uh, it doesn't matter if, you know, most of your batches are a lot smaller. If you've got one batch that's 16 samples, length 512, the training is going to crash. You're going to run out of memory and get a, a CUDA error. So the limit for the K80, which is kind of like the, it seems to be the most common GPU that, that Colab will give you. Um, the limit seems to be around like 400 tokens. So we're going to, we're going to truncate to 400 um, because we have to <laughs> for it to fit on the K80. If you get a, there's also a, a GPU called the P4 that I don't get very often, but uh, uh, it does show up sometimes and it only has like six gigabytes of RAM. So if you get that one, you're kind of hosed. You kind of want to like, I don't know, start another runtime or something. Try to try to convince Google to give you a different GPU. <laughs> uh, all right. So we're going to, we're going to uh, go through the whole, the whole training set. We're going to tokenize and encode. Um, all of the text in code, meaning, you know, mapping tokens to their IDs. We are going to add the special tokens. We are going to truncate to that max sequence length, but we are not going to pad. That's kind of the key difference here. So we'll do that for all 25,000 training samples. And then uh, we'll sort them by length. But before we do that, I wanted to kind of see like, all right, what, what is the, um, what do the links look like in the current unsorted order of the training samples? So going to measure the lengths of all the training samples and then just kind of plot them with a scatter plot. And yeah, you know, it's, it's varied. They're all over the place. This, uh, this bar at the top is, is because apparently there are a lot of samples that have been truncated to 400 tokens. Um, but yeah, it's pretty just, just random. So now we can sort them by sequence length. Um, yeah, one interesting point is that there, there's sort of two, two approaches that you could take to this that are pretty similar. You could sort the data set by the string length, uh, and that's what Mikhail's code does. Um, what I've chosen to do here is to tokenize first and then sort by sequence length. Uh, I've tried, I did look at both and confirm that they're, um, uh, they're pretty similar. They're, the results are pretty similar, so I think either one is fine. So yeah, we're gonna to zip together the training samples with their labels to kind of keep them together. 
and then we'll sort that combined list based on the length of the training samples. So that gives us our sorted training samples. And so now each training sample is like a, it's a tuple. It's got a, it's got the, a sequence of input IDs uh, representing the text and then it's got a label. And we can see that the, now that they're sorted, the shortest sample has 13 tokens and the longest sample has been truncated to 400. So now that, now that it's sorted, we can kind of redo that plot that we just did. We can sort, or we can measure the lengths of all the, the training samples now that they're sorted, plot them. And yeah, we get this kind of, kind of interesting curve. It's a little bizarre why, you know, there's this like hump here. Um, I bet there's some kind of interesting explanation for that. And then up here, of course, we've, uh, uh, we're truncating to 400. So apparently there are kind of like a lot of samples that, um, pass that mark and are being shortened to 400. All right. So now they're, now that they're in sorted order, we can do our, our batch selection and we're going to, we're going to pick random batches, um, using a batch size of 16 and yeah, we'll find, so we're going to loop over all the training samples, um, the actual batch size, of course, is you know equal to batch size up until the last batch, which is basically the remainder, how many we have left. Um, we're going to pick a random index in the list to uh, start the batch at, and then we'll select the batch, you know, starting at that index, and then just taking sixteen samples, um, sixteen contiguous samples from that from that part of the the list. And then we'll uh, we'll split the split the, the samples back into two lists now. Again, um, sentences and labels. And then we remove that batch, the batch that we just took. We remove it from the training samples list, uh, and then keep looping until the the list is empty. So we'll do that. Get about fifteen hundred batches of training samples. And now that our batches have been selected, now we can go in and we can figure out for each batch. What's the longest sequence? And we can pad out to that. So for each of the batches in our training data, figure out what the maximum sequence length is inside the batch, and then figure out the number of pad tokens we need to add for each of the uh, sequences in the batch. Um, padding, pretty simple. You can look up the pad token ID from the tokenizer class. And then, you know, this syntax, if you're not familiar with it, it just uh, creates a list of um, all the elements will be this value and the number of elements in the list is given by numpads. And then with Python lists, if you use the plus operator, it's, uh, appends the two lists, uh, concatenates them. Um, so that, that gets us our padded input. I have to create the attention mask now, which is, uh, you know, pretty similar logic. We just put zeros wherever the pad tokens are. And then we can add our, um, padded sequences back to the, the new, um, the new lists. And finally, we got to convert them to PyTorch tensors. So, yeah. So now that we've um, now that we've you know done the smart batching, we can figure out how many. Um, yeah, to what degree it's cut down on the number of tokens in the data set. So we can basically just go through all the batches, all the samples in the batches, uh, make a list of all their lengths sum up those links and we've got the number of tokens in the data set after smart batching. And then for comparison, the, the, um, fixed approach is, is easy. It's just the length of the, uh, maximum sequence length times the number of samples. So yeah. So if we do fixed padding, we've got 25,000 training samples, a fixed length of 400 tokens that gives us a total of 10 million tokens in the training set. Whereas if we do the smart batching approach, we save about you know thirty uh, a third of that, and it's down to six point three million um, tokens. So pretty cool. And then if if you want to um, benchmark the smart batching approach versus the fixed um, fixed padding approach, I've included this cell here, which you can you can run basically instead of running four point two to four point four, uh, you can just run this one cell. It'll use the batch encode plus function. Um, it'll truncate to 400. It will, it will apply padding and, uh, yeah, it'll create attention masks, return PyTorch tensors, all that good stuff. And then you've got the same data set to feed into the rest of the notebook. And you can see the, the difference in training time and see if there's any difference in accuracy. 
Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning of the video that in order to implement smart batching, I kind of had to work around the existing libraries. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, here's my uh, BERT fine tuning sentence classification on the COLA data set. What I use for batching here is uh, the PyTorch data loader class. So from Torch, um, let's see, that's the random split, excuse me. I keep down here, there we go. Data loader. All right. So the data loader takes our training data and we define a sampler, um, which you know dictates how it's going to choose the uh, the samples to put in the batches. So the data loader creates the batches for us and random and does the randomizing. And it also takes care of like doing it differently on each training epic. So for smart batching, uh, I essentially you know, did away with the PyTorch data loader. And we just have our own batch data that uh, that we're gonna go through. Instead of taking the, the batches from the data loader, you know, we've just, we've just got a, a list of PyTorch tensors. And then something I forgot about initially is that um, we do need a different randomizing, uh, randomization of the data set for each training epic. So uh, after the first epic, we want to basically redo all that smart batching to create a different set of, of batches. And for that purpose, as well as just, you know, for more practical application, um, I defined a, a function that essentially does all the steps from 4.2 to 4.5. So it's, you know, a reusable function. We'll want to call it here to regenerate the data set. Yeah, and so you can take a look at that uh, the function, but it's it's the same stuff as 4.2 to 4.5. So after training, we evaluate on the test set and let's take a look at some of these results. All right, so I had to, uh, it took me a while to get these these de uh, benchmark data points because Colab like kept giving me different GPUs <laughs> and I needed to, to run it twice on the same GPU in order to compare, um, you know, apples to apples. So smart batching has a slightly higher accuracy, 0 0.935 versus 0.93. I think Mikhail found the same thing in his experiments. And it, you know, it makes me really curious to go look at the, the attention masks, um, how that's implemented exactly. Because it seems like maybe um, maybe the, the padding tokens do influence BERT's you know, interpretation slightly. Because there does seem to be this kind of consistent small difference in accuracy. And then, well, you know, the most interesting part is the speed. So the old fixed padding approach is 18 minutes longer, about, you know, 50% longer than uh, smart batching. So pretty big, pretty big speed improvement there. And let's see, I think that's, um, that's everything. So I'll probably, I think, you know, I had to do this custom, but I think uh, gradually the community will probably figure out uh, like how to how to do this properly within you know the PyTorch data loader and within the transformers library. So you know maybe I'll update this this notebook as things develop. But that's it. All right. Thank you guys.